sorry, I was running late. I'm here at the Butler Institute of American Art in Youngstown, Ohio. The Butler has a special interest in ceramics, and this piece by Susan and Stephen Kemeniffi is an excellent example. It's called Raku Platter. If you could run your hand over it, you'd feel the line Susan drew into the clay to create the woman. Another way to create tiles is by using molds. It's like, well, it's like, it's a lot like the sole of my running shoe. Well, here, see? Whew, sure was a relief to get that off. That's what this raised area is called in sculpture, a relief. See this area is cut out to create the tread? When I take a step into soft snow or mud, the tread creates a pattern in the snow. Bob Yost of Akron, Ohio, creates ceramic tiles using molds. Each of Bob's tiles are individual works of art. Sometimes he creates a set of tiles from one mold. Even though they're the same tile, each is hand-painted and glazed so that each is a little different. This is a lot more interesting than tiles which are photocopies of each other. All of the tiles may be of the same design, but the small differences mean that each is an individual work of art. client comes to me, they kind of have an idea in mind of what they'd like. So I do my research, I go to the libraries, I pursue books that I have collected. Well, once I find my design in the book, I go to the copier place and I make it the size that I want, and then I put, put a piece of plastic over that uh, copy, and then I trace the design onto the plastic. And then I lay that image onto the clay. And then I just transfer that image from the uh, plastic back onto the clay. So I cut out the design. Then I go back and I clean up the edges. This is considered a relief tile. And since this would be raised, it would be a raised relief tile. I do two different types of relief tile. I do raised relief and sunken relief. It's a matter if I want the image to come from the wall or be sunken into the wall. But once I have the relief tile, what would be the master? Uh, I need to make a mold of that so I can make multiples. I'm making a frame around the original tile, so when I pour plaster over top of this, it'll contain the plaster within that frame. This is a polymer clay I use to keep the plaster from going underneath of the boards. Once I have it well attached and all the seams smooth, I'll spray it with a releasing agent. And then we're ready to pour plaster right on top of this mold. I kind of sift this plaster through my fingertips so I don't get any clumps down into the water. I'm basically going to fill up this bucket uh, with water in it until I get it like an island of plaster into the center. Once the um, uh, water has saturated the plaster, I then mix the plaster. It takes about two minutes. I always mix by hand because it allows me to see if there's any clumps of plaster or anything down in, uh, inside that I wouldn't be able to tell if I'd mix it with a, uh, a drill with a mixer on the end. It's getting to the thickness I like it to be at this point. Uh, it's holding the line a little bit, and uh, so I'm ready to then pour it into the mold. I pour a little bit in, and then I kind of blow the... Blow the plaster around the details in the mold. This is a shaker ball, and I turn this on, and it brings all the air to the surface. And that brings the air pockets up from the tile, up from the front surface to the back of the mold. About 30 or 40 minutes after I poured that plaster in there, it's hard to the touch, it's warm to the touch. I can release the C-clamps and take this form off. But I use a plastic tool so I don't scratch or mar the, the mold. I do lose the original tile that I carved. There's a mold of our original tile. And then I let it dry for a week or two. And then once it dries, this would be that mold. I'm pressing the clay into the edges of the tile mold with my fingers. And I make sure there's plenty of clay, more clay than I need, before I go to the tile press. I put it up into my tile press. Put a piece of canvas over top so it won't stick to my tile press. Now I have the clay firmly pressed into the mold. I use a twisted wire to cut off most of the excess clay. And I use the edge of a board to take the remainder of the clay off. And now the back of the towel is flush with the mold. 
Uh, what I want to do is identify my tile. So I have my logo onto a piece of plaster. So I can press it into the back of each tile. I usually put the mark of who designed that tile. I have a few friends that help design tiles. I do that mark. I use several clay bodies, and so I identify the clay body with a number in the corner. It'll take about uh, 10 minutes for that clay to dry, and it'll kind of pull away from the plaster mold. I uh, have a rubber mallet, kind of encourages it to come release the rest of the way. The reason we use plaster is it absorbs moisture and pulls that moisture out of the clay and releases the tile from the mold. And then our, that's our finished tile. I set these on pieces of drywall, plaster, and that helps them uh, dry evenly and flat. The next part of the process is to glaze the tile. And I don't want to put glaze on the back of the tile, so I wax the back of the tile. Set the back of the tile into the paraffin wax. And then I sit it over against the fan and it lets it dry. This is my glaze. We mix up batches of about 8,000 grams in a five gallon bucket. Copper oxide is the colorant in this glaze. Basically, take the tiles into the bucket in and out. I wipe off the back. You can see how it beads up on the back. Typically, I glaze with just one glaze. I use glazes that change color as they thin and thicken. So like in this tile, where it's thicker, it goes black. And where it thins over the edges of, of the relief, it goes a brown. I try to use as many glazes as I can that kind of emphasize the relief aspect of my tile. What a great way of starting your day to go into a, a kitchen or a bathroom that has handmade tiles around it. It's not machine made. It's made by an individual here stamping up one at a time. So I do believe that will make a difference. And these are all raw materials brought out from the earth. And they're going to live with you. They're, not, they're going to outlast your home. We're bringing in some quality materials that work on many different levels besides being functional and beautiful. You know, they are going to last. Clay is very permanent. As you can see, creating tiles is a pretty involved process. Learning to go from design to finished product, the students at North Canton Middle School had a lot of fun experimenting and had some very interesting results which showed off their creative designs. This is going to be created out of clay. You're going to be cutting out pieces of cardboard. So if by chance you have very intricate areas in your design, you may have to adjust them so that you can cut them out with scissors. Template's the exact size and shape that your tile will be. This is a six by six inch square. And for our template, we're just using cardboard. Okay, if you are going to be cutting out and gluing on like I did, mm -hmm. some of the areas are glued on. Mm -hmm. and we're going to call that the positive right now, the yeah. ones you pick up and glue down would be the positives. It's called buttering. And what you do is instead of squirting it all over the place, in order to get the glue all the way to the edges, butter it with the glue. Once you get your clay, you need to bring it over to your area and begin flattening it out. The process that we are going to be using with clay is the technique of a slab. The reason for the two sticks on the side is so that when you roll this out, like cookie dough, the rolling pin will not go any thinner than the sticks. So, 
you can assume that your tile is going to be this thick. Okay, make sense? Okay. And you want to roll in all directions using the sticks then as a guide for the thickness. You've gone through a lot of work of cutting all these pieces out. Now's the time to put that to work, and we're going to place that side then down and roll and press. Be sure that the tile doesn't move. When you put the glaze on, you're not going to be able to see all of your indentations of texture. The texture's going to be covered up with the glaze, although when it goes in the kill, it will melt and you'll be able to see it again. This is the way it looks like in the bottle. What you're dealing with here, then, is a chemical. The chemical changes. It's not like a pigment, like paint. So the chemical is going to change uh, to create the leaf green. Glaze is actually liquid glass. We can think of it as being liquid glass. And it doesn't really turn and into glass until after we fire it for the second time. What fire has this been? First or second? Second firing. We're ready to see what the finished product looks like here. Wow. All right. Cool. Great, great. Many of you are familiar with ceramic tiles. You see it every day in bathrooms, kitchens, and borders, and things like that. But most of those are created in factories. Each of them is the same as its neighbor. Many old homes and buildings have tiles that are created individually, using the same techniques as Bob Yost and the students of North Canton Middle School. Teaching materials for sharing art are available on the web at wneo.org slash sharing art. Funding for this series was provided by the Martha Holden Jennings Foundation and Northeastern Ohio Education Association. NEOEA's members include elementary and secondary teachers, university professors, and support professionals proudly serving students attending the public schools and colleges of Northeastern Ohio.